Hello Grade 12s and welcome to another Geography lesson. My name is Bonzet. I just want to take this opportunity for liberty to make this show possible. It's definitely helping all of you guys out there to be able to revise. And take your smartphone and go and download the Tenfold Education app. Lots of goodies on there, revision material, and even lessons that's been prepared for you that you can use for self-study. And while you're on it, go and follow us on YouTube, go and give us a like on Mindset Learn. Once again, many goodies on there, and live shows, and all material that you can use for study purposes as well. Okay, today we're gonna have a look at just some questions that the grade 12 learners tend to struggle with, with paper two. Okay, and we're just gonna revise a couple of these questions and I'm also gonna focus a little bit on map work, which is in paper one as well as paper two, especially with calculations. Now, when we look at this paper, remember, we focus on settlement and economic geography. Most importantly over here, grade 12s, is your concepts. You need to understand your concepts and to be able to define them. Okay, and the first topic that I want to discuss with you is just rural settlements in general. Okay, because we have different patterns and different shapes, which is vitally important because they're going to provide you with infographics, you know, images, maybe a map, and you need to be able to, what you've learned, your concepts, which what you understand from your concepts, apply to the infographic that's being given to you. Okay, and not only with the classification of different rural settlements, but also the different patterns that we need to go and have a look at. Now, I've used the question of rural settlement patterns. Now, first and foremost, let's just quickly define a rural settlement. Okay, it's focus on primary activities. Now, when we look at primary activities, right, and primary activities are mainly farming, forestry, mining, and fishing. Especially, now, when we discuss economic geography, when we focus on primary activities, we tend to focus on mining and agriculture. Now, for this year, we're focusing on sugarcane and on maize farming, right? We did this, and when we look at mining, we look at platinum and gold. But coming back to primary activities, it's vitally important, right? Because we are seeing so many issues that we experience in the rural settlements. First and foremost, when we especially look at agriculture, crop farming are very important to us. Mostly because it provides us with food security, okay? Food security means we have enough food on a daily basis, right? And it adds to our GDP. Right, and the next question we're going to focus on, we're just going to focus on subsistence and commercial farming. But coming back to this topic, it's vitally important because it means we can earn foreign income from it and we can provide our nation with food. Now, the first, if you look at this figure, the rural settlement plan, right? We looked at primary activities. It can be agriculture, farming, fishing, forestry and mining, but we have different patterns. In this case, as you can see, we focus on farming. How do we know that? Because we're dealing with cultivated land. Okay. Now we have different patterns. First and foremost, we have dispersed and nucleated patterns. Now dispersed is when <coughs> Apologies, the settlements very far from one another, the farms. Okay, and nucleated is when they are very close to one another. Now, there's a bunch of reasons why, because you need to look at physical factors, natural factors. Okay, now when we have abundance of water, it's no point to be nucleated. Okay, because there's enough water for irrigation purposes so we can farm more, okay? The same we need to look at the topography, okay? Especially if the area is flat, right? It makes it possible to be dispersed, okay? Nucleated, when people live close to each other, like in a village, right? And it's usually subsistence farming, 
Right? It might be because of the topography, it's very steep. Or it might be because I just want to go to the bottom of the page because of dry points and wet point settlements. Right? This is very important. And I see the learners tend to set, struggle with this. Dry point settlements and wet point settlements. Now, a dry point settlement, think of this. This is the easiest way to remember it. Think of it. It's usually when the settlement are nucleated, right? It might be, think of it, they want to stay dry. So the area might be prone for flooding, okay? Especially next to a river. Or it might even be dispersed, right? A dry point settlement is far away from water sources because it might be prone to flooding. A wet point settlement, in most of the cases, If you look at the wet point settlement, it tends to be a rural settlement pattern that's nucleated, where the people are very close to the water resource, because the water might be scarce. So I'm just going to write there with dry point settlements, it might be prone for flooding. So think of it that the people want to stay dry. Wet point settlements is when Water is a scarce resource, scarce resource, people live very close to the water resource for domestic use and for irrigation purposes. Okay, so we need to be able to distinguish between these different concepts when we discuss all of these diagrams. Now, as you can see on this figure that's been provided to you, right? First and foremost, keys are being used, same as in map work, to identify what's what you see in front of you. We can see a river situated over there. We can see a road and we can see buildings. Now immediately I hope you agree with me that you can see that this is a dispersed settlement because the buildings are very far from one another. Okay. They're not very close to each other and you can see that it's farming taking place because of cultivation taking place if you look at the key that's being used over there. Now, what will be the purpose of being a dispersed farmer? Okay, dispersed farmer means you're farming much bigger land. Okay, now I've mentioned to you the physical factors and I've mentioned to you the natural factors like the topography, there's also a physical factor, it's flat land, there might be enough water, there's enough water because of the river, so it means they can farm more. Okay, and as you can see they are close to the road, it might be perishable goods, to be able to transport their goods. Now, if you just have a look at some of the questions being asked regarding the settlement pattern. Identify the rural settlement pattern in figure one. And we identify it as dispersed. Now, the simple reason, and I think that's the next question, why did we say it's dispersed, right? Give one reason for your answers because the buildings are far from one another. And we can also say this adequate water supply because we can see the river is there. Okay. Now, just to throw a spanner in the works, right? It's not one of the keys, but let's assume these lines are contour lines, right? So when the contour lines are far from one another, let's say it's spaced out, No, it's a gentle gradient. Basically a flat surface. Okay, so that's an another reason we can use. Let's assume this is contour lines. And we can just add a flat land. Okay. 
question 1.3 identify the primary economic activity that most people living in this settlement would be involved with and that is definitely is cultivated land so that will be farming okay what type of farming might be crops might be sugarcane right all the paints okay now State two possible site factors that influence the people to live in the settlement. Now, grade 12, there's another two concepts that you need to be able to differentiate. is the site and situation. The site is being chosen, right, because what is available for resources. In this case, there's a river flowing over there. Right? The availability of water. We can also mention this fertile soil because we can see there's water close by and there's a lot of farming taking place. And because of the infrastructure, access to a transport network. Okay, so that was the site of it. Now the last question, and it's a paragraph question, very importantly, once again we need to have a look. And I'm going to combine the rural urban migration movement of it. Poor farming practices results in low yields in the illustrated landscape. Write a paragraph of eight lines in which you analyse the impact of poor farming practices on the economy and the rural depopulation. Now the reason why I chose this question because we combine, I'm going to combine it with the movement of the rural urban migration. Let me just wipe this off. Okay, and a couple of pointers that I want to discuss with you. Unfortunately, we are seeing a rapid movement of people from rural areas to urban areas. And we refer to that as rural urban migration. It's the movement of people away from rural areas, right? And as you can see, they've mentioned one of the reasons, poor farming practices. Okay. Now, once again, and I'm going to integrate our next topic with this question, right? The push and pull factors. So you want to ask yourself, what pushes people away from rural areas? Okay. In this case, we need to concentrate on the economic activity, the primary activity, and that is farming. Okay. What pushes people away from farming to go and live in urban areas? Now, first and foremost, natural disasters. Okay. It's not being asked in the questions, but... I'm just mentioning it because I'm covering all the bases. Natural disasters, such as floods or droughts. Now you need to keep in mind, right? This is an activity where people earn income. When flooding or droughts take place, it means there's no income available for the farm to be able to sell their produce. Okay, now what happens? What forces the people to leave this farm? Unemployment, right? The farmer might decide to sell, right? Or, right, let's say for instance he's farming with stock, right? Because he experienced a drought, many of his stock has passed away, died, right? It means less workers are needed. So that causes this rural urban migration, right? Natural disasters such as floods and droughts. Another reason that we can mention over here, right, what negative impact is going to be factor? It's going to have a negative effect on the economy. You can also say the GDP and even foreign income. Now, once again, when I just mentioned this topic to you, right, we discussed it. I think the, one of the most important uh, factors when we look at the agricultural sector is food security, 
right? It's vitally important because we can produce our own food, right? Instead of importing food, it's much cheaper. And once again, this term, and I love to use it because it's got a multiplier effect, right? When we look at food, right, the majority of the agricultural products are being processed, okay? So now we're moving away from primary sector, we're moving to the secondary sector, when we are being processing and manufacturing, right? Think of sugar, and that's one of our topics for this year. If you think of sugar, it's the raw material that's being processed in sugar mills, right? Into refined sugar. Now, what can we do? We can export that material, right? Or product to different countries. We can earn more money. We can earn more foreign income. Now, I think of the multiplier effect, right? The second industry is the processing of the goods. Think of the packaging of the goods. Think of the advertisement of the goods. Think of the transporting of the goods. That's the multiplier effect. See how many people are involved as soon as we start to process it. So that's it. When we do poor farming practices, right, it's going to have a negative effect further along the way. Now, if you just look, for instance, at the grape industry down in the southwestern Cape, right, processing making of wine, being exported to European countries. Okay, once again, the multiplier effect that I'm discussing with you. Think of all the people involved. You know, we can talk about graphic designers, we can talk about advertising agencies, we can talk about console, glass factories, manufacturing the bottles for them. So it's a massive multiplier effect that's taking place. So it's gonna have dire consequences for the economy when we look at it. Right, another reason what you can mention over here, right, the land becomes less fertile. And that means less production takes place. Okay, now, going back to that, right, to the rural urban migration, right, now, as soon as all these people move, right, what happens, right, there's going to be a decline in rural activities. So, it can lead to ghost towns. Now think of it this way, right? Because of poor farming practices, right? It means unemployment will rise. It means the spending power of the people that used to work in the rural community is not there anymore. So just assume you had a grocery shop, right? Or you had a hairdresser shop. Now all of a sudden, the buying power is not there. The buying power is not there every day because the people are unemployed. So what happens? all these small shops eventually closes down. And that will lead to lack of services. So we can also mention that. Such as schools might close down and clinics might close down. Okay, and eventually what will lead to it? It will lead to this rural urban migration taking place, leaving us with deserted towns, ghost towns. Okay, but let's just quickly go back, hand in hand, with this push and pull factors. In this case, what pushed us away from the rural areas? Unemployment, soil is not fertile anymore, natural disasters, might be because of mechanization of the farms, people are using modern technology to be able to farm. Right, so there's less employment opportunities. Now that leads to the rural urban migration. Now, and I'm just going to throw my hat in here and explain the pull factors to it as well because it's different. Why do people want to move to urban areas, to metropolitan areas like Johannesburg, Pretoria, or Cape Town? Okay, simple reason: there's better job opportunities. Okay, there is tertiary education, for example. Uh, 
universities, colleges, right? Better infrastructure, better service delivery, better housing. Okay. But mentioning a vis a vis question as well, right? With this movement of people from the rural urban migration, it creates problems for our urban areas. Okay. And we've seen it because we have a massive influx of people moving to our urban areas. So it leads to what? Housing shortages. It leads to the development of informal settlements because there's not enough housing for the people, right? So they'd rather go and live on the outskirts and in informal settlements. Okay. So that's a concern. Overcrowding, right? Crime might increase. Why? Because what people are looking for employment opportunities, but they can't find any jobs. But just think of the pressure on municipality services. Think of water, electricity, sanitation. I mean, collecting rubbish, right? All of a sudden, you've got a massive influx of people moving to these urban areas, right? And the infrastructure can only take that much. So eventually, it's a hell of a lot of pressure on the infrastructure. Think of the sewage, electricity, and water, like I've mentioned. We're quickly going to take an ad break. See you in a couple of minutes.